Top Med Talk. Well, hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host, and I'm joined by my co-host, Professor Michael Grocott from the University of Southampton. Michael, it is wonderful to see you. Desiree, lovely to be here. And yeah. You did normally call me Mike, but Michael is fine. Well, okay, day. I like to be formal first. Yeah, yeah, It'll okay. be Mike from the rest of the, okay, the madam. way. <laughs> so I like the sound of that. No, <laughs> Mike, um, you flew in this week just for the meeting this weekend. It's been great so far, yeah? It's a really interesting meeting. It's a very, uh, I think, an innovative program this year. There's a, there's a lot of uh, maybe a bit less anesthesia and a, a bit broader brush. Some of the uh, technology talks, there's been a little bit of space. There's some quantum mechanics, I think, this yes. afternoon. It's yes. a, a, a really interesting program. Yeah. So, Mike, we are at the IARS or the... So, IARS Soccer A UA. UA. So, the International Anesthesia Research Society. Yep the Society of Critical Care Anesthesiologists, and the Association of University Anesthesiologists. You are so much better at that. (laughs) I've made notes. It's good. It's good. Well, it is. It's their annual meeting here in Denver, Colorado. And we've had the privilege to be in the exhibit hall doing the thing that we love, sitting down, talking to the speakers, the attendees about the program, and really what is up and coming in the world of anesthesia. Um, You know, great pro. Great presentations. The posters have been really cool. And uh, there's a buzz in the air here, Mike, I kind of feel like. It, it, it's really nice to see people face to face again. Yeah. I think, you know, it's been a while for a lot of people. Uh, and, and this is a, it's a small, it's an intimate meeting. There's a lot of academics, a lot of researchers, uh, a lot of uh, really interesting new thinking around. So everybody you meet has got something new to tell you about what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. So, Mike, before we get uh, into our first interview, actually, of the meeting, we want to just talk a little bit about Top Med Talk. It is the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. Mike, tell us just a little bit more about EBPOM. So, EBPOM, as as you said, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine is an organization that's been running for 25 years pretty much now. Uh, We started off with a small meeting on the west coast of Ireland and then a meeting in London, and we now... Uh, with partners have meetings around the world. So in Australia, in Singapore, in the US, uh, and and links links with other meetings internationally. Uh, and, and it's all about, uh, I guess, what it says on the tin. So it evidence-based is. perioperative medicine, improving perioperative care collaboratively around the world. Yeah, they're great meetings. We have one coming up this summer as our next one in London. It is actually EBPOM and the World Congress of, of Prehabilitation. Prehabilitation. Yeah, so second time we've hosted, we hosted it just before the pandemic uh-huh. uh, and we're now hosting it again and it's a it's a meeting which uh typically moves around the world uh-huh. it just happened we, we've been able to uh, have the infrastructure to host it i think we're going next to australia and then to canada after oh. that in 24 and 25 but yeah. this, this london uh, this this summer in london yeah and then we have a meeting coming up at dingle if you want more information about eb palm and the london meeting and dingle ireland meeting which is absolutely fantastic check us out at ebbom.org you will get more details there uh you can buy your tickets and see what's on the program so do check that out we just want to take one moment as well to thank our sponsors through the generous support that we receive, we are able to bring free ed- education, free perioperative care education to clinicians all around the world. So it's so important that we are able you know, to have um, the support to be able to do that because it, it is really, it's, it's a unique opportunity for us to be able to, to participate in that. So thank you to our sponsors. So um, diving right in, because we're getting ready to go into a session here in just about 15 minutes, we wanted to catch up with a friend and a neighbor of mine, uh, Jai Pong Wong, uh, professor of anesthesiology from the University of Louisville in yeah. Kentucky. Jai Pong, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, that's right, Mike. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to join this. And uh, actually, I watch Talk Matter Talks all the time, so I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot of things. So you say you. the nicest things. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you do. Well, actually, we've been talking about getting you on the podcast. It right. seems like for a couple of years. Or uh, I know. Four we years did. now. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so finally, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Well, great. Well, Shai Pong, um, just for everyone listening at home, tell us just a little bit more about yourself okay. um, and your practice there in Louisville and about maybe some of your research interests. Sure. I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, so I'm a cardiac and transplant anesthesiologist at the University of Louisville. I've been at the University of Louisville for 21 years. I did my residence down there, then stayed down here. And so my practice is really cardiac trans- cardiac and transplant anesthesia. I take care of people for cardiac surgery and transplant surgery. 
Uh, most of the time I work at a Jewish hospital, U of L Health, and uh, that's a major cardiac transplant center. We do about a thousand parts a year. Uh, we do all five organ transplants. We do heart transplant, lung transplant, kidney, liver, and pancreas transplants. And uh, I do spend a, a, a little, maybe a day a week at a university hospital too, where I do a lot of trauma and do a lot of OB cases down there. Uh, so I kind of see both worlds. And uh, so Jewish hospital is more like a private practice tertiary care center, university hospital is a more academic center setting. So I really enjoy both sides. And uh, uh, I, you know, my, re- I, you know, I, personally, I have a lot of research interests, maybe too much, <laughs> so I need to come back <laughs> on there. Uh, so a couple of my, you know, research interests, of one is a really primary hypertension and raw heart failure. Uh, as we all know that, you know, heart failure is hard to treat, and especially the raw heart failure. Nowadays, we have a lot of ways to treat left heart failure. We can put a pump in there. The left ventricular assist device, they all that works pretty well. We don't have such things for the right heart. And the right heart is really thin. If the pressure is too high on the right heart, it doesn't work. It will fail. So I have a research lab at a CII, Cardiovascular Innovation Institute at UofL. Uh, so we actually have a mouse models for raw heart failure and primary hypertension where I study the molecular mechanism. So what's behind the raw heart failure? What's behind the primary hypertension? Uh, our recent work being focused on the environmental factors in primary hypertension. Yeah. So what we found was uh, several metals are significant increase in patients with uh, primary hypertension and raw heart failure. Uh, so we're, you know, we try to, uh, we actually uh, uh, get a several funding, risk funding on that, and we try to figure out what exactly does it do to the heart, and uh, it's better the right heart. And hopefully, if that's the case, we can figure out how to treat it. So we, if we get rid of those metals, the bad metals, make sure the balance of the good metals are in place, maybe we can help to treat the right heart. Uh, so that's, you know, what I do in the laboratory. Uh-huh. And uh my clinical uh, side, I'm, uh, I'm really into echocardiography, and I do a lot of echo. And uh, and uh, as you know, echo is the ultrasound of the heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, we right now we do echo for all the heart surgeries, uh, pretty much all the transplant surgeries on there. And uh, recent interest I have is I work with a professor at the University of California, San Diego. So we uh, he developed a variable ultrasound. So that's like a sticky pad that can do ultrasound for your heart. Yeah. So it used to be when you do ultrasound, you got the big echo probe yeah. and you got to manipulate, you got the big machine. With this variable, you just put the sticker on the, on the chest, it will do the ultrasound for you. And we use AI machine learning to give you, you know, number that you know, the cardiac output, the, you know, the, what, what's, the, uh, uh, what's the ejection fraction. Yeah. So they will come on there. So we try to bring this to clinical use at UofL mm-hmm. Health. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, it's not in the work. And that's uh, one of my, you know, interesting clinical uh, side of things. Uh, the other interest is really, uh, I think at this meeting, there are a lot of talks about AI, machine yes. learning. That's a new buzzword for everything <laughs> out there. So, I, you know, my personal take on that, it, it is important. I think we need to know. And I think it will affect how we do uh, do anesthesia nowadays. And uh, uh, as you, you two are fully aware, as an anesthesia provider, there's so much information. Mm-hmm. You got the monitor, the heart rate, the blood pressure, you got the one liter information, you got the base monitor, you got the cerebral oximetry. Our brain just won't be able to process all that simultaneously. And I think the studies say you can only, human brain can only do six signals at the same time. More than six, we're just okay. going to pick the six that we think is important. So my interest is really to use AI machine learning to predict hypotension. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of work has been done by your team. And uh, hypotension is bad, right? Yeah. Even short period of time, they can increase your mortality, morbidity. So we try to use, uh, I work with a team of uh, AI machine learning experts. So what we try to do is uh, we try to use AI machine learning that's interpretable. So meaning that we as clinicians, we understand that. So nowadays, most AI machine learning is a black box, right? You put the information in there, somehow they do the calculator, they give you output. You don't know. That's why we don't trust them. We're like, how did yeah, you get that? That's true. Yeah. So so that's why so the the team that I work with, we give you the reason why we got there. Why 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 we predict that. And uh, and then how you know how we can use this information to guide the physician to to treat or the provider to treat. Yeah. Yeah. So. So you've given us so many jewels to pick from. There. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> right. great. Can, 
I'm, I'm kind of into the so, uh, the ultrasound, the sticker sure. that sticker that replaces the cardiologist, as we were talking about earlier. <laughs> yes. I mean, how far are you going in terms of some of the more complex variables, some of the diastolic function, right heart failure, tap right. disease, E to A ratios? Can you can you pick all those out, or is that a, a work in progress? I think that's a study work in progress. So right now, we're able to just get the two D pictures, mm-hmm. and so we use AI machine learning, and we're able to get the ejection fraction, the warning status, and we have not developed the Doppler yet. Uh, and we have not developed the color Doppler either. So meaning that they, they will require more development on valvular assessment, right? Do you have much rigor, right? Right now we can't do it. We just, you know, we got the 2D and that's this a prototype. And I think with, uh, you know, I think it's a balance between how complex you want that thing to be and versus the cost, right? You can certainly make this really complex. You can do all the functionalities, but it will cost a lot. People can't use it. My, as, as I talked to you earlier, I, my imagination of this technology is eventually every patient come to the OR, every patient in the ICU, they will have a sticker on there. So the provider, the nurses, the doctor, they can just see the heart right, right there. And uh, to develop those advanced technology, the diastolic dysfunction, the raw heart failure, the valvular assessment, I think they will take quite a bit uh, you know, resources to develop. So to answer to your question, we're not quite there yet. We're still working on development. But yeah. there's no conceptual reason why it can't be done. It's it's, it's a right. development journey rather than an absolute. Right. I think it's definitely doable because, uh, you know, ultrasound is really just the black and white dots at different intensities. So yeah. I think you can assess those. And uh, put on color Doppler, I don't think it's that difficult. I think it, they are doable. And I think that will be the next stage of the development. And uh, so the... The team that we work with from UCSD, they they're wonderful engineers, and I don't think there will be a barrier for them to develop. It's a very very cool tech. That's a, yeah. I got to give me complete change of direction. But uh, <laughs> but when you were talking about the metals, yes, um, which, which I presume uh, is as a, an environmental toxin, it so, is. I mean, does that have all the implications with uh, as we have with most of these environmental challenges of? Uh, socioeconomic and diversity r- sure. racial type uh, exposure issues sure yeah, that, that's a wonderful question and uh, so what we found are really two metals we, we actually we found uh, uh, three or four metals that are significant out of a patient with a primary hypertension one of the metals is antimony uh, so I have to search it up what that is. I was just going to ask. I know. Because I don't know if I know that metal. So, so antimony is the metal they use in the bullets, in the firearms. Oh. So if you go to the actual data study in the military uh, research, so if you, you test the, uh, the soil or the water near shooting range, the antimony level is significantly increased. And I, you know, I, I cannot see for 100% sure, but that definitely there are areas uh, in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. They're shooting ranges, right? And and uh, their level might be higher. So those patients might be prone to getting developing right heart failure. And uh, the uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, we, we get in the metal from different sources, the water, the soil, or the crops that we get. And certainly, you know, for pe- in the rural area, they don't have all the regulations. Certainly those metal will be elevated. Uh, so I fully agree with you. I think that most likely there's a social economic association with the palmer hypertension and those factors. And is your data, it, it's all Kentucky data or is it is it more general, generalizable? Because you'd imagine there might be different metals in different places right. that would be uh, causing trouble. You're definitely right. So our initial preliminary data is uh, all Kentucky uh, from University of Louisville. So we just sent in uh, R01 uh, H grants. So what we propose to do is there is a huge primary arterial hypertension data set in Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So they have the sample, they have a blood sample, they have the uh, blood sample, serum sample, DNA sample from about a thousand patients uh, down there. So our proposal were to measure the metals on all those. And then we're gonna measure the metabolic pathways. Uh, so the metabolize in those, and we're gonna use AI machine learning to figure it out. Are, is there a correlation, right? How can we deal with those? Can we treat those? Oh, you know, maybe, Treatment A does not work on somebody with a higher level of antibody. So, so that's the, I, I think you know that that hopefully will help help us to get a better idea of the geographic distribution. You know how the impacts will be. And it all it all comes back to this notion, which a, a lot of things we talk about at the moment, sort of individualized medicine, but picking yeah, out the right. particular challenge for a particular patient. You're definitely right because patient A and B they might all have primary hypertension, but their metal level might be totally different. 
So yeah. we need to treat it differently. So. It's, it's so interesting. We've had the, the, the same themes just keep coming up here uh, at the meeting this weekend. We have time for one more question, Mike. And it did you? I saw you write so, down. Well, I'd say that, I mean, the third topic you raised was prediction of, of blood pressure changes. Now, obviously, right. there are commercially available devices to do that. I'm, I'm guessing you've taken a, a slightly different approach. I mean, can, can you share a little bit about what you, be, you, you do? Sure. And, uh, you know, we actually, you know, the food is our work with the Edwards acumen team, and uh, we actually use the, use the HPI index. I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I think what that does, it really gave me. Give me pathophysiology right on the monitors. So I, I this is how I teach my resident nowadays. I say, okay, look, your blood pressure is low. You check your HPI. Is that high or low? So you know what's going to happen in the future. They're going to check the, is this is a preload issue, contracted issue, or offload issue. So I think this, I really enjoy what HPI provides. However, and uh, uh, I think, you know, there's certainly there are more things that can be done. For example, one, can we predict hypotension further away? Right. So right now, I think HPI do pretty good five minutes beforehand. But how about 30 minutes before? Can we predict that? Then the other one, I think that, you know, my team will try to do, we have some preliminary data, is we want to predict the exact blood pressure. So instead to tell you pressure will be low, we're going to tell you it's going to be 82 uh, versus 85. And uh, uh, one of the model that we developed actually works pretty accurately. And uh, what we found, though, it, it work, you know, different model function very different in different patients. Like for people who are seeker, one model works really well. You know exactly they match the dose really well. But for a healthier patient, it does not work well. We got to use a different model. Uh, so that's that's you know we still try to figure it out. You know why the reason is, but it seems to us is for different patient population, a different model is needed. Uh, we so, we kind of need a model to work out exactly which, which model. <laughs> exactly we need a model to figure out which model will work the best. So yeah, that's all where we are. We did turn a National Science Foundation uh, grants try to do that try to do this work. Uh, so, but I think there's uh, you know we all know how potential is bad and uh, how to take care of those are not easy to do. And uh, I think that uh, uh, they are uh, you know we certainly want to use AI machine learning. Our initial thought is really to incorporate uh, patient factors in there too. Yeah. Uh, do you have diabetes? Do you have heart failure? Right. And uh, and uh, but certainly they will introduce different challenges in there too. And are you moving on to decision support, even closed loop type technologies? We do. So uh, one of the expert is uh, decision support expert. So she, uh, Dr. Bai, she develops the uh, support system for Kentucky, uh, like you know where you put the charging station for Tesla and stuff like that. So what we want to do is really, based on our prediction, uh, we're going to use reinforced uh, learning model uh, yeah. to do that and and uh, to really figure it out, uh, really treatment support, right? So if you do, if you treat somebody at three months and we're going to take it in all those considerations and see the response from there, then make a recommendation at six months. So sort of you learn a little bit over, 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 uh, over time. And uh, uh, what... You know, I think I'll tell you the challenge with those are is one is the uh, the data is not clean up. Uh, so you cannot use the EM data directly. You got to clean up the data. That's very time consuming. And the two is different hospitals. The format is different. They don't want to share the data. Okay. And uh, uh, we, uh, you know, you develop something at Euro Health. Most likely it doesn't work in order. Yeah. A different patient population. Yeah. So that's a challenge we try to uh, help. Uh, there is a M- MPEG, MPOG. Uh, so I'm working with them to see, you know, we, we can join. But I think the, the quality of the data is definitely number one. Then the other one with those is it got to be real world application. Real world, yeah. Right? right. You can't see, you know, I developed this in vacuum, right, in the RV tower, right, works really well in my well control tertiary care center with a full research coordinator, you know, all this all the time. It got to work in the real world. I yeah. think that's the challenge and how to apply those that we think would work really well in our well control setting, how to apply to real world. We don't have the answer yet. And but I think that's definitely a huge f- future that, you know, we need to work on. Yeah, well, I think the real world is about to intervene 
So I do. Us, we I have was a session gonna... coming up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the the AUA session on interfaces of quantum physics and biology. Yep. That's going to be fascinating. Yep. So we're going to run to that. Jai Pung, thank you so much no, for sitting down. Amazing with us. work going on. At it the, is. Thank you. Just University saying, congratulations on everything you're doing. And we're going to catch up soon with you and, and maybe take a deeper dive on something. That'd be great. Stuff. That'd be great. Thanks yeah. for this. Great to talk to you. Yeah. Thank thanks you. so much for listening to Top Med Talk. You know, you can find us at topmedtalk.com and uh, on your favorite social media platform. My goodness, it's the first time we've had an interview in a while, Mike. So <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing Starting great. Thank you once again. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, thank really you so thanks, much. Thank Cheers. you, Sarah. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.